Okay. Um, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Grassroots Economic Organizing Discussion on Owning Together. My name is Ajawa Ifateo, and I'm a GEO co-editor. GEO, as our group is known, is a volunteer collective with the mission to catalyze cooperatives and other solidarity economic projects. This discussion on owning together is part of that mission. And I just wanna just give you a little background that this food, this uh, discussion came about after we showed the film, the food co-op uh, about the Park Slope food co-op in Brooklyn back in November. So we had a lot of questions about how is it possible to organize such a co-op? And um, and that co-op, the workers are required to, uh, I mean, there's two, in order to shop, you have to work there. And so there's a lot to learn about how these uh, organizations are done. We wanna give a special thanks to all of our panelists for sharing their experiences with us. And we are very happy that you have come together to hear about how workers and owners and consumers uh, can do what is being done. George. All right, thanks, Hajua. Um, yeah, this, uh, this is a very timely topic as, as you already mentioned. And uh, we do have some resources. We had earlier indicated that they would be sent in advance, but a couple of them are academic papers by our moderator and a panelist, um, so by Margaret Lund and a colleague, and by Fred Freundlich and his colleagues. So if you're interested in receiving those papers, we can send them to you individually and simply indicate in the chat um, your name, email, and yes, resources, and, and ye shall receive. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to introduce our moderator, uh, Margaret Lund, who will then um, lead the discussion for the panel, facilitate the discussion. Margaret is an independent consultant specializing in the areas of community development finance and shared ownership strategies. Throughout her 30 year career, she's worked with enterprises in every major cooperative sector, including credit unions, consumer co-ops, housing, worker co-ops, healthcare, ag, and small business. Prior to launching her consulting practice in 2008, Ms. Lund spent 16 years as a small business lender to co-ops. She's a past member of the board of the U.S. National Cooperative Business Association, where she chaired both the Cooperative Development and International Development Committees, as well as a national task force on cooperative capital formation. She also served three terms on the board of Health Partners, the larger, co largest consumer-governed healthcare organization in the United States, and a leader in healthcare quality measures. Currently, she's one of the trustees overseeing the Cooperative Charitable Trust, a catalyst for research and innovation, um, and in worker ownership. Um, Margaret is the author of numerous practical publications, including Solidarity as a Business Model, a Multi-Stakeholder Model, um, and a, a recent paper um, uh, with colleague Sonia Novkovich. So, Margaret, um, thank you very much, and um, welcome. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So our structure today, um, we're going to move along. We've got like kind of four questions or groups of questions for the panelists to address. And then we're going to have time for questions at the end. And you can put them in the chat and people will be monitoring and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So um, so the first question panelists, which is which is pretty easy, um, would just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about about the co-op you come from. Um, and something you like about your co-op, or I always, I'm always really interested in asking people what they're proud of um, about their work, what they're proud of about their co-op. So, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about about you and and your multi-stakeholder co-op. And I'm wondering how we should go in order. We should probably keep going in the same order all the time. But let's start with Weaver Street. So John and James, maybe you guys start. Sure, my name is uh, John McDonald and 
I am, I manage the bread bakery at Weaver Street. Um, I've been at Weaver Street for 15 years. I'm most proud of our bread. That's an easy one. <laughs> um, and uh, I uh, served on our board of directors um, for eight years, um, rolled off around three years ago. Um, and we have three Weaver Streeters here, so I'll be quiet so <laughs> we can introduce everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm James Watts. Uh, I'm uh, the merchandising manager at Weaver Street Market. I've worked here since uh, 1992, uh, so almost 31 years. And uh, I guess what I'm proudest of are the things that we do that build um, cooperative commerce, both locally, but also internationally. And so we were a big part of um, getting uh, La Riojana's uh, co-op products into the United States in a meaningful way. And um, that's been incredibly impactful for both them and for us. And so it, you know, I guess as a merchandiser, seeing products on the floor from other co-ops is a thing that excites me. So that one's a really stellar for us. Alana? I am Alana Hines. Um, I've been with Weaver Street for 15 years. I am the manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I also am the board chair. So right as John rolled off, I rolled on. Um, I'm currently in my third year, and I am most excited genuinely about the work that I do with Weaver Street Market, um, working to essentially to reframe the box that Weaver Street has put itself in with the community and really redefining the words that we use when we say community and looking just to help local entrepreneurs and to rebuild the local economy. It's my favorite. Great, thank you. I'm sorry I missed you in the introduction. Um, okay, Madeline from Blackstar, we'll just stretch all the way to Texas. So tell us about your co-op and what, what you're proud of, what you like about it. Uh, my name is Madeline. I am the business manager at Blackstar Co-op. It is the world's first cooperatively owned brewery, and we are also democratically self-managed. We were founded in 2006 in Austin, Texas, and have had our doors open since 2010. I joined the staff in 2021, and what I am most proud of with my co-op is we were Brewery of the Year in the state of Texas last year. Cool. That's great. Um, so we're going to stretch all the way to what, Fred, are you, are you actually in the US or are you in Spain? But well, if metaphorically, if not actually stretch to Spain. So Fred's um, from Mondragon University, and I think we all are familiar to some degree with the Mondragon Co-op. So, um, so, but tell us a little bit about them and what you do there and, and what you're proud of about your work and your organization. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Fred. I'm an American transplanted uh, to Mondragon in, in 1995. I work at uh, half at the business school of Mondragon University and half at the School of Humanities Institute for Cooperative Research. Um, both of those faculties are, are multi-stakeholder co-ops. I think I'm most proud of our work in helping cooperativize the core economy. A lot of co-ops are in the new economy, in the uh, in <clears throat> in mm, sometimes marginal activities, and I think it's extremely important for our movement, for working people generally, that co-ops also be in the core economy building stuff. Thanks. Cool. Okay, and then um, Elizabeth uh, Jesdale, is that correct? So Elizabeth is. Um, and to tell us a little bit about both about her co-op and her work um, in at Hunger Mountain. So please. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Jesdale. I've worked at the large food co-op in Montpelier, Vermont for 23 years. Um, and in 2003, I was part of bringing a union into the co-op. Um, I was promptly demoted from management, threatened to be fired. And uh, but I, I toughed it out and I'm still there. I'm a, now a member of the union. Um, and we are not a multi-stakeholder in the way that these the other co-ops are that are, that are here on this call. But 
being that we're a consumer co-op and there's a union within that organization um, and our union is rank and file democratically run. Um, we also have a voice and we have a, contra a legal contract with the employer. Um, so it's, it's different, but we also have a voice and sometimes we are able to sway policy um, if we're organized enough to do so. Uh, proudest thing, I would say I'm gonna go, I'll just go with my union just to give something a little different. Uh, our opening preamble that was written in 1936 uh, states that our union is open to all people regardless of gender, what kind of work they do, all the categories. And that was written in 1936 and it still stands today. And I'm, it's a, awesome. Thank you. Cool, thank you um, for sharing that, great. Okay, so now we're gonna get in the nitty gritty and I've, I've been writing about multi-stakeholder co-ops for, I don't know, whenever I wrote that book, like 15 years. And what I think people like, they always give me like this little glazed look and they're like, well, how does that even work? You know? Yeah. So our first, or I guess our second question is, <laughs> how does that even work, right? So so briefly for each of these, these co-ops or organizations outline the structure of both of the ownership and the governance, right? So the joint ownership and the joint governance and how those, those both work. Um, and then, you know, like our, our crib notes say the challenges that come from that. Um, and so maybe you could just say, like, if you've had particular challenges in the U.S. from, you know, are there, is there legal or financing or there's something that um, have impeded it? Although I've got to say, because Fred's on here, like, I'm not sure in Mondragon you have like legal or financial legal challenges to do multi-stakeholder co-op. So maybe you could take the other thing about like, well, how does the policy context broadly, you know, support what you're doing? because um, that's a question too. So I think you could talk about both challenges um, that you've had in implementing, but also flip it and, you know, to the positive about like what, mm -hmm. you know, what um, advantages or, or, you know, whatever, what good things have kind of come from this structure as well as challenges in trying to implement it. But um, okay, so but anyway, just like, how does it actually work? <laughs> you know, and like problems, good things, bad things you've run into that have to do with that structure. That would be really helpful. So let's start with Weaver Street again, Alana. And John and James, however you want to work it out. <laughs> okay, um, I'll actually take that. So I often get questions about multi-stakeholder, how it works. Um, a little about Weaver Street. So we are 35 years old. Uh, we have adopted policy governance. And we, as we've said, we are multi-stakeholder. Um, to date, we have 171 worker owners. We have roughly about 300 uh, workers overall. Um, and then we've got a little over 26,000 consumer owners. So amongst all constituents, we aren't the type of co-op where you have to work there or you have to do something. You don't have to be an owner in order to shop at Weaver Street Market. So we do have four stores. We also have a food house where John is. The difference um, with us and the question that I oftentimes get is, what is there a conflict of interest? There is not a conflict of interest. In my 15 years, I haven't seen it. Um, you know, John or James may be able to tell of other times. I'm sure that there have been times where you know you kind of have to question, but essentially you're hiring people, you're putting people on the board um, based on integrity, based on character. So you're putting people, you're appointing people to the board for that reason. Our board consists of seven individuals, the GM two worker owners that are elected, two consumer owners that are elected, and then two appointed members. So you do have that representation on the board, which is why I love being on the board, um, because you do have that representation. You do know that out of the workers, there's not just some separate entity making all of these decisions. They don't know anything about operations. So throughout the business, there is a separation between operations and between the board. Um, I would say one opportunity that we always face, especially with turnover and operation, things like that, is really educating the workers on the board, what the board does, the function of the board, really the importance of ownership in general. Once you are an owner, then you do get to vote for the board. Um, and so understanding you know, exactly what that means because it's not often found, especially with businesses, you shop there and you don't own the business that you're a part of or the business that you work for. So you know, I would say that's the biggest opportunity challenge, I guess, but I think it's more an opportunity really to just figure out that sweet spot between how do you educate your worker population and then also how do you really utilize and leverage the power of your board in 
being able to have that strong conversation with your workers so that you're not getting into kind of the nitty gritty, but you're actually looking at the visioning and the governing and the different responsibilities of the board. Great. And do you find any challenges like just, I don't know, legally in your state or, or um, you know, your bank saying that sounds weird or anything like that or? <laughs> um, well, I'll say in my three years since Weaver Street has been around for quite a while, I haven't found any. Um, just because, you know, with our audits, with our banking structures and things like that, they're well versed in what we're doing and how we're doing it. So being able to separate, you know, the financials of operations being audited by the board, things like that. The board does speak to the auditor at the end of each audit to ask questions. It does show up in our financial reports. So it is something that we are monitoring when the GM, he essentially reports to the board. So we monitor his statements. He gives, you know, different reports on operations, the health and the wealth of operations in general, so that when we are looking ahead, we are able to say, you know, I mean, with our appointed members, with our consumer owners, and then also with the knowledge of our worker owners, if there is a question, um, then we essentially, we have lawyers that we can say, you know, maybe this is something that we should ask the lawyers. So we do have that on our side as well, so that we're not kind of going rogue and saying, we think that this is going to happen. We hope that nobody audits us when we turn in our tax returns. We essentially say we have those people on our side that can monitor and to watch. And they know that we are a cooperative. They know our business structure. They know that, you know, especially when we do go into things like we do, uh, we distribute a dividend in profitable years. So you know, even going through that financial structure and saying, this is compliant with where you are and this is actually a good move, that conversation is had not just with the GM and the finance department and operations, but it is also had with the entire board. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Any of the other two from Weaver Street, do you want to add anything? And structure, okay, cool. Thank you, Elena. Um, Okay, so so Madeline at, at Blackstar, so how does joint ownership and governance uh, work at your co-op? Um, so Blackstar is a consumer owned co-op um, and our workers can become member owners. Uh, we are owned by roughly 4,000 consumer owners and we have a, they elect a board of nine people. We have the ability to have up to three workers on that board. However, currently we have no workers presiding over that board. The workers assembly um, is made up of roughly 17 people right now. And about five of us are member owners and therefore vote in board elections, any changes to the bylaws, but as well as we make up the voting body within the workers assembly and we make all major decisions for the cooperative. Uh, I always describe the relationship between the board and the workers as the workers are responsible for the operationals day to day and the board is responsible for the longevity. So they just make sure that their decisions that we're making aren't gonna shut us down. Um, and yeah, some of the difficulties that come with that is, you know, we are a restaurant brewery and the restaurant industry faces a lot of turnover and a lot of difficulties. So we don't have a lot of long-term employees. So therefore they're not really familiar with how the democratic structure works. What does it even mean to be in a co-op and just like historical knowledge that's needed to run the co-op. Um, the longest employee that we have right now is about two and a half years, um, and we've been open for almost 13. Um, some other really difficult things that we face are the pandemic was really unkind to most businesses, especially restaurants. And so a lot of the reason why we're even open is because of uh, federal relief funding that we were able to receive, like the payroll protection plan, the restaurant revitalization fund, and the employee retention credit. Um, and to get into the legalities of that, it's extremely hard to file for federal funding when you don't have a sole owner who can file for that. They typically want to know about 51% of your ownership and they want to know everything about that person. Um, and that would be roughly 2000 people for us. Um, so it's also very difficult. We are in the state of Texas, and I don't know if anybody else is from Texas, but the TABC laws, which is our beverage um, commission for alcoholic beverage, it's also very difficult to, um, to distribute beer and to maintain a liquor license when you can't report on 51% of your ownership structure. 
Um, so we have to jump all of these hurdles in order to maintain our liquor license and maintain that we are able to serve alcohol beverages. Um, the other difficult thing about our cooperative, I would say, <clears throat> is that 4,000 people make up our owners um, and they're very excited about Black Star. They're very excited that we have award-winning beer, that our staff is treated fairly and that you can get good food there. But not a lot of them know what it is to be a member of a co-op. So a lot of them just join because they're like, oh, I get cheaper beer if I'm a member. Um, so when we do have elections for the bylaws, when we do release our annual reports, when we do have elections for the board of directors, um, it can kind of get selected by people who don't really know what's going on and don't really know why they're making the choices that they need to be making. Um, and that has a lot of effect on the workers. Hmm. And just to clarify, it sounds like a lot of the problems you had were just with the co-op structure in general with vis-a-vis -vis the programs. I mean, it, so it wasn't the fact that you had a worker council running it. It was the fact that you just had a whole bunch of owners. Is that right? Yes, it's very hard to apply for federal funding um, yeah. and get that whenever you don't have one owner or just a small group of owners, uh -huh. um, especially because our board is reelected every three years. So we found a loophole where our board president could be uh, listed as our owner and she could sign all of the documents. But now that it's time to actually report on all the government funding that we received, we have a different board president. Mm -hmm. and trying to work with the small business association and trying to get relief on all of those things they're like well, why are you changing owners like why can't she just be the person to sign again yeah like, so that's not a, the president anymore so mm -hmm. that's a problem lots of co-op <laughs> run into it all their states yes. okay um and maybe i just just to follow up i'm just doing my own questions but you know um so have there, I mean, it sounds like there have been workers that were elected to the board in the past. Do you know why there, there aren't any right now? I mean, are people, you know, this current crew just new and they're not, they don't really, are not interested or do you have a thought on that question? I think the workforce has changed a lot. And while a lot of people are really interested in getting more involved in their workplace and seeing like change that they want to enact, a lot of people also just want to come to work and collect a paycheck, just want to do the best job that they can and not get more involved than they need to be. Um, so we are seeing that shift as well as you do have to pay to become a member owner, just mm -hmm. like anybody else. Um, and that is a barrier for employees. Like, do I really want to invest in my restaurant or do I just want to go there and collect a paycheck? Um, and you do have to be a member owner to run for the board as well. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so Fred, can you talk about at Mondragon, what exactly, um, and you're part of, so the university is multi-stakeholder and I know Roski's multi-stakeholder um, and there's other multi-stakeholder co-ops in the in the Mondragon um, group. So how does joint ownership and governance work for, for these kinds of co-ops and are there challenges that you face because of it? Um, or is it, or because you live in worker co-op heaven, you don't have any challenges at all? That's what. <laughs> right. This is workers' paradise. We have no challenges or problems. Exactly. That's what we all thought. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, the, <laughs> the fact that I mean, for all of the uh, good circumstances that led to Mondragon's development, um, <clears throat> I mean, they came upon the idea of creating multi-stakeholder co-ops jointly very early on. It was still the Franco regime, the dictatorship. So by the time democracy was uh, reinstalled in Spain in, in, the, in the mid 70s, there was a large multi stake there was a large cooperative group with lots of multi stakeholder co ops. And so, because of Mondragon's presence, influence, communication, um, co op legislation pretty easily began to reflect that. So, it was no problem legally, legislatively, to create a multi-stakeholder co-op with whatever kind of member you might be interested in, in including. <clears throat> and then government bodies began to provide funding mechanisms for multi specifically for multi-stakeholder co-ops, which has been very helpful for, for different co-ops over, over the years. Uh, there are lots of challenges, though. I mean, all of the challenges that all multi-stakeholder co-ops have uh, with respect, or, or all co-ops have, with respect to ensuring different voices are well represented, um, ensuring ensuring that 
that their voices are real and ensuring that their, uh, their voices are really heard, um, especially as co-ops get larger, of course, <clears throat> and ensuring that the board has enough technical expertise to really be able to monitor and contribute to strategy and to, to monitor management and the progress of the company and to contribute uh, to developing strategy and policy with, with management and with and, and, and with uh, as broad a, as large a number of worker and other members as possible. Um, there's also the issue of, can it get too big? And some of you may know that two big co-ops, co-op groups partially significantly left the moment on structure in December. And there's lots of debate about why and lots of different points of view. <clears throat> but it certainly seems to raise the question whether uh, a multi-stakeholder co-op that involves co-ops as members can get too big. And even though its governance bodies are representative, uh, governance bodies, ultimately representative bodies become small. And can this lead to the perception, if not the reality, who knows, of those represent those governance bodies favoring certain sectors or certain geographic areas over others or and or diminishing the autonomy of those sectors or or areas. So it's led to it's led to uh, a big debate about that. And that's another another one of the challenges. I mean, I oh I I you know people in Mondragon always recommend to other co-ops to create uh, multi-stakeholder co-ops that involve co-ops working together, cooperation among co-ops, but it does lead to these challenges. Okay. All right, thank you. And then Elizabeth, could you um contribute to this in terms of, of at least how, if not ownership, but maybe governance or joint influence or something works. So what challenges have you come up with legal challenges or financial challenges um, that arise from, from trying to involve multiple stakeholders in your organization in some way? I'll mute myself, thank you. Um, that's a really, these are, this is so fascinating. So, um, The, the co-op has a traditional board structure um, and there are three seats that can be filled by uh, workers, employees, um, and no one ever runs. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure why that is. I think a lot of it is we're workers and a lot of people are paycheck to paycheck and we're tired and we do enough at work as it is, and um, folks are, especially after these last three years, you know, pretty burned out. Um, and interestingly, we have a staff rep who sits on the council, who is a bargaining unit member, a member of the union, but they're a non-voting member of the council. Um, and they can't sit in on executive session. And that's another key point. If I, as an employee, were to go and run for the council and get on the council, I would be excluded from executive session. So th there's, there's a lack of transparency there. Um, mm. And I can understand why in some cases, but there's big decisions being made in those executive sessions. And, and um, I could say that I believe that our council tends to hold things in executive session that it doesn't necessarily need to. Um, and I just wanna add in here that um, I am a unionized worker. We are one of the only locals in the United States, if not the only that has a free speech clause in our union contract. I want to clarify that I am not representing my employer in this conversation. And I am saying those things so that I don't get disciplined or fired. So um, yes, are there legal conflicts? Absolutely. And between the union and the co-op, um, 
it's different than a regular employment situation. If somebody has a grievance against the co-op, there's a process for that. And it ends in an arbitration and uh, an arbitrator comes in, listens to both sides and makes a decision. And then both sides have to live with that going forward, um, whether we like it or not. And of course, if we don't win, we don't like it. <laughs> um, there's probably a lot more that I could say, but in the interest of time, I'll I'll pass for now. Thank you. Okay, so that was an interesting point. Just to um, circle back to some of to uh, Weaver Street, Elena and, and Fred, where you actually do have workers on the board. Is there are there anything that that worker board members? I mean, are they can they sit in executive session? Are there anything that they're not allowed to do because they're workers as well as board members? Could you? Um, Elena and then Fred, could you comment on that? Yeah, so our worker owners do sit in on executive session. Um, they are essentially, they are full board members all around. Um, if there is an issue that seems like it may be compromising in one way or another, we are definitely, you know, we have the open conversation of whether we would recuse ourselves or whether other board members feel like it would not be appropriate. But overall, yes, board members are there for everything. Um, speaking as the board chair, I essentially, you know, I help to design the agenda for each meeting. So designing the business meeting, the uh, executive sessions, everything like that. Yeah, that's it's the full responsibility of a worker owner on the board. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Fred, just in the Mountain Ground co-ops, are there, are there things that are in the, in the ones that are multi-stakeholder, are there anything, any difference between the workers that sit on that board or other and consumers that sit on the board? No, no, there are no differences there. They take part in 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 any in every decision and uh, and have the right to all information, et cetera. Um, Non-worker members in several multi-stakeholder co-ops, uh, <clears throat> boards in some multi-stakeholder co-ops have created a sub-board that's just to deal with worker issues, worker member issues, and this is always voted on by the full board. And the full board uh, negotiates what kinds of decisions the sub board, the worker sub board might make and which ones they'd have to be informed about, which ones they need to participate in, that kind of thing. So in multi-stakeholder co-ops, some, in some kinds of decisions, non-worker members don't participate. Okay. And, um, George, did you wanna? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just for a sec. Um, I just wanted to mention to the panelists, not that we want to distract you from this wonderful conversation, but if you can glance at the Q&A occasionally, there are some very specific questions in there about specific co-ops. And I think those could be answered quickly in the chat, and then we'll hold the broader questions till later for discussion. Thank okay, I'll, I'll try to pay attention too, because um, one that just came through, which I thought was really interesting, as, as the those of you that that there are workers on the board, are there any like are they management? Are there any workers? Is there a restriction? Can certain manage can managers not, or the managers are only, or whatever? Is there anything that has to do with somebody's job that also you know impacts their board membership? Um, I can answer that question. Yeah, for Black Star, yeah. sure, um, at Black Star, we don't have a GM as of right now. We have what is called the board staff liaison and that sits at the head of our team manager council. Um, I am the board staff liaison and I am not allowed to sit on the board. Um, and I am the only worker that is restricted from sitting on the board. Okay. For Weaver Street, all workers, um, as long as you're a worker owner. Uh, but once you are a worker owner, everybody can sit on the board. So it does not matter your position in operations. Hey. I just want to add one quick thing about Weaver Street that I think is important and it'll be quick, but we, uh, the workers on the board don't represent the workers like in a direct sense. Um, and it's something that is sometimes a right. little unique, a little bit unique. So like everyone on the board represents the entire co-op right. um, and we're a consensus board. Um, and so that's really the only way that that works. Um, so just want to put that out there. Okay, yeah, so you're not a direct representative, but your experience is beneficial, is, is that, I mean, that's, okay, all right, good. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Um, 
to the kind of third question, which has to do with uh, with sort of development and modification. And this is, an, and even if you guys who have experience in this could just think about like if you were starting a new one, because that comes up a lot. People have been asking me this a lot, like how, you know, how should we do this? We start a new one. So one question is like, if there've been modifications over the years and how, like you started out with saying one way and you change the way you do something over time for some reason, if you could talk about that, maybe modifications in the structure um, over time. And then also sort of in related, um, if you could think of those of you who do have, have either been on boards or have been in board meetings, you know, are there, can you think of instances where you think the board made a really different decision because of, of having workers on the board or you know represented in some way like did it make a difference like because that's one of the things people like well it's a lot of trouble right does it make a difference to the organization and to the board and so if you have any um any examples of where it's made a difference so both the structure of you change structure or you know is there anything about you have thoughts about how your co-op is structured that's good or bad or you know that you've changed in it and what difference does it make so that's the thing so weaver street which one of you is going to James. Okay, please. So I think that the um, I was on the board in the mid '90s, so we were a pretty young organization, and it was a little bit of the Wild West. Uh, quite honestly, consumer owners and worker owners didn't understand that we represented the entirety of the ownership. We didn't understand all of the nuances between what is governance and what is management. And uh, as a result, the, it, there was strife um, often. And uh, I think that that was really um, our work was to actually discern how do we move forward in a way that is actually going to make this better. We did have uh, consumer owners who were trying to uh, engineer the worker owners off of the board and out of the ownership of the co-op. So, you know, there was, there, it was stuff, you know, there, there were politics. Um, I think the big breakthrough was uh, with, for us was when we adopted a policy governance model, uh, partly because it established clear roadmap for what was governance and what was operations and how do you keep the, board members in their lane and how do you keep the employees and management in its lane and you know and what do those lanes look like um so you know uh, back in the back in the mid 90s into the, into the late 90s we spent a ton of time doing that and we started with somebody else's sample policy manual and literally went through policies for meeting after meeting after meeting where we said does this solve the problems that we're having? Does this meet our needs? What do we need to do in order to make this a policy that will be useful to the ownership of Weaver Street Market? Um, you know, and 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 th you know, over time it got easier as those things got resolved. And uh, by the time uh, John uh, came on to the uh, board a couple three years after I left you know, things were beginning to move in the right direction. You know, we were beginning to really gain some traction from that um, clarity of expectation about who who had which role and for what reasons. Um, so I think that that was big for us. I mean, I, I quite honestly, I think that uh, it's been freeing for the various stakeholder groups in the co-op to understand um, how do we go forward? What are we doing to make our decisions? And how are we making sure that as a result that our decisions uh, create the outcomes that we're trying to make in the world around us? So, you know, um, I think uh, the, it doesn't, I, I won't say that it solves every problem. And certainly, uh, you know, I I recognize that um, our structure isn't always in practice perfect and doesn't always feel exactly like what people want it to feel like. There is a componentry or a component of the worker owners that think that 
the worker owner representatives should be more responsive to the needs of individual worker owners or the worker owners as a group, as opposed to the needs of the ownership more broadly. And similarly, the consumer owners occasionally, especially if they are very well versed in, in co-ops, might have a similar um, wish from a different perspective. So, you know, we still see that that's out there, but this serves us pretty well. Okay, thank you. Um, so Madeline, could you talk about Blackstar and this question, have you made some changes and, and what difference do you think it makes, um, that, that your structure makes in your organization? Um, so yeah, so as well as being a cooperative, Blackstar is also a democratic workplace. Um, and when Blackstar started in 2006, we didn't have a GM. Um, we still don't for all intents and purposes, like when it comes to signing documents and the person who has to lay down the law sometimes, that's me. Uh, as I make my exit from Black Star this month, I, the board has now said that we are going to have a GM. Um, so the workers assembly is now tasked with either promoting from within or hiring an external GM. I think a lot of the reason, this has been a long conversation since before I even started at Black Star about the potential of having a GM versus just having four team managers uh, kind of guide the ship together. Um, but the board has decided that without a GM, we can't accomplish accountability, profitability, and growth um, because we don't have a central person um, and we don't have somebody who the board can directly hold accountable um, for lack of um, compliance with our governments. So that is a really big change to Black Star structure uh, for the past 13 years. We have operated without a GM um, and it will be very interesting to see how they operate with the GM after I leave. Okay, cool. Um, Fred, would you like to address that question? If, um, if there have been kind of changes in the way that, that um, multi-stakeholderism is practiced in your co-ops and what difference does it make in the decision? I mean, does it even make a difference to have different people at the table? Sure, it's it's all over the map, as you might imagine, with um, there, there are over 20 multi-stakeholder co-ops in, in the month run group. So all kinds of places where, where workers are essentially silent and it would take, you know, serious research to figure out what influence they have. have there are others where uh, they have significant influence. Thinking of my own co-op where I have uh, witnessed, experienced. Uh, so the, in, in my own co-op in, in, the, in the business school, in, in the university, there are three constituencies. There are workers. Workers have a third of the seats in the, in the GA and the board. Uh, students have a third of the seats and collaborating co-ops have a third of the seats. And when we, Mondragon has been worried about creating new co-ops and co-oppreneurship for, you know, for decades and back, I don't know, uh, 12, 15 years ago, we decided to create a teampreneurship degree program for undergrads. And the worker influence on the board in the creation of that degree program was such that uh, we decided to use sort of a radical teaching and learning model that's very sort of very dramatically experienced based learning by doing maybe even too much but in any case that's another another debate but uh as opposed to a more it was certainly had planned to be somewhat more participatory or somewhat more engaged but it was it was viewed it was viewed in somewhat traditional terms at first workers on the board said no no if this is going to be serious teampreneurship then we have to we have to have a totally different teaching and learning approach. And it's a very different teaching and learning approach 15 years later. Interesting. So it made an enormous amount of difference. Oh, huge, absolutely huge yeah. in that case, yeah. Interesting, okay, thank you. 
Um, Elizabeth, would you like to weigh in on, on this question um, about structure and then what difference that what difference does it does structure make or doesn't it? Well, obviously have a union in a workplace has a huge difference. <laughs> um, most of it, in my opinion, is good. Um, when before we unionized, the starting wage was 50 cents above minimum wage. And then not too long ago, we were $3 above minimum wage. And that never, ever, ever, ever would have happened without a union, not even close. Um, now it's less than $3 because minimum wage has gone up. Um, and our wages have not grown at the same rate that they used to. Um, so that's just right there is a huge difference. Um, our health care, the reason, the, the kind of spark that led to unionizing was that uh, our health care was basically going to be taken away from everybody that wasn't a manager. Um, and we still don't pay a premium for our health care 20 years later, although Unfortunately, we had to sell ourselves out and that will be changing in the next couple of years, uh, much to my great dismay. Um, you know, it's an interesting question of, of participation and because I'm thinking, you know, I, I apologize. I'm like eating my lunch during this and I'm rushing around and my camera's wobbling and um, you know, I'm doing this off the clock. Like I had to punch out to come do this. And I had to have this big co dramatic conversation with not dramatic, but this big, well, are you representing Hunger Mountain and blah, 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 you know, all this kind of stuff. And so, and then, so it's just, it's like, how do we as workers get to participate when we're rushing, when we're not getting compensated for our voice being part of the discussion? Um, and when, in fact, most people can get fired or written up for, for participating, you know, not staying in their lane. Um, and so, and I'm so interested in what the other panelists are saying. And of course, you know, we've had many conversations at Hunger Mountain about, you know, how, how could we be a worker? You know, how could we be multi-stakeholder? Um, and, and I don't have the answer, but... But without being here, we're missing out on a huge part of the conversation. Um, and I don't know that I'm directly answering the question, but this is sort of what I'm thinking about and I appreciate it. I appreciate being able to be here, um, but I'm off the clock. And I'm not gonna say that I'm resentful about that, but it kind of stinks. I'm using my valuable vacation time to be here. So, um, and I don't need to thank you for the thanks, but I, you know, it's important to me. It's important to me that workers are equally at the table with everybody else. And so I'll, you know, I appreciate being here. And I also am like, you know, how can we act? Where, 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 where's the equity? Where's the equality? And that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so the fourth, and, and we have a ton of great questions, <laughs> the question answer. Um, so we're gonna get to as many of those as we can. Um, but the fourth question kind of has to do with this idea of ecosystems and co-op support. And um, we'd like you each to address from your point of view and your experience, um, what, how can the broader movement better support or refine or, or help people have good experiences um, in multi-stakeholder governance and ownership or influence. So how can the rest of us, what, what can the ecosystem do um, to make it better? What has, what has the ecosystem done that's really helped you or supported you too, I guess, on the positive side? Um, so what, what are your recommendations like for, you know, whatever, those of us building a cooperative economy, how can we make it, make it, um, make the good, bring the good parts of the experience to more people is, I think is the bigger question. Um, so, uh, Weaver Street, who, who have we got? John? This one's my turn. Great. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think, I think at, at Weaver Street, one of the 
biggest imp or some of the biggest impacts we've had is just in cooperating with other co-ops. And you know, uh, the example James used at the beginning uh, with Riohana is like a super cool example. Um, you know, we get a great product, and then you know, by cost in the United States buying directly from a co-op in Argentina, they get uh, capital they need to do, you know, to make real on the ground difference in their community. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all probably have examples of how that happens on us, you know, on a more local scale uh, in our communities as well. And, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, people need to see co-ops that, you know, so also I, I really appreciate what Fred said about co-ops need to be a part of the core economy. And, um, you know, I think um, one thing that Weaver Street has done well over the years is we've really tried to be an uh, active competitor in the grocery marketplace rather than just be, you know, a co-op off, off to the side. We try to keep prices competitive. We try to have the products that people want, but also to stay true to our values as well. And, um, you know, and I think a resource that uh, has been helpful in that is um, there's a group called Co Illuminate um, that is a co op of consultants, basically. Um, and uh, they work with mostly grocery co ops. And um, they, uh, they have been very helpful in when you have workers on the board who, you know, like we've been talking about, work, work eight hours a day, then you got to go to a board meeting or when I started on the board, I, I had a college degree, but I didn't know anything about the grocery business. You know, I got into, into Weaver Street because I wanted to bake. Um, so, that, so to have this knowledge base that we can tap into, and it's people who share our values and understand the project that we're trying to do, um, I think is invaluable. And, you know, even the questions that have come up today, like, Black Star dealing with management changes and, um, you know, Elizabeth and unionizing versus worker ownership and can those work together? Um, like, and, you know, even having this call, like more, more stuff, um, more of like a collective knowledge base uh, and um, needs to be created so that, uh, so that, because so much of what co-ops do is on the ground and, and, and just takes a lot of work. And so to be able to have a resource that folks can easily tap into and share with one another uh, to continue to make real differences on the ground, I think is, is something that is growing and, and, and exists, but I think it just needs, we need more and more of it. Thank you. Um, so Madeline, from, from your experience at, at Blackstore, how could, um, I guess we could we could help the state of Texas understand how multiple people can own a business would be one thing we could do to help you probably. Um, but what other ways could the ecosystem um, support or do you think the ecosystem could support uh, your kind of organization? Um, so Blackstar is a member of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. We are registered as a democratic workplace, which is how we're able to be members. Um, and they do a lot of really great work that I would like to see, like even if we were in a democratic place or other multi-stakeholder co-ops would be able to benefit from as well. Um, they are the reason why we are able to offer health, dental and vision coverage to all of our workers. Um, they offer a lot of really great cooperative training. Like we do have such high turnover being in the restaurant industry. So it's really hard to get all of our employees together and like kind of teach them like, this is what a co-op is. Um, but they offer a lot of really great training that I think is really essential to empowering our workers to make decisions for their own workplace. Um, another really great thing that they have helped us with is when we initially started back in 2006, they helped us form all of our governance, um, our policy register and our bylaws, and they connected us with other cooperatives in the area to help us do that. But they took it a step further and they um, helped us create a governance calendar based off of our governance. Um, and that has been really essential in getting our member owners involved in board meetings because they know like, okay, today 
they're going to be talking about self-management and that's something that I need to be up to date on and I need to know um, how self-management is going at Blackstar. So being able to have that public um, so our member owners can join the board meetings whenever we're talking about topics that they're interested in. Um, yeah, so I think that the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives has done such a great job being a resource and I would like to see something similar for member cooperatives, uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives, I mean. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> I mean, that's a great idea of what, you know, just, just having a more detailed thing so people can just be part of this conversations that they need to be part of. That's really neat. Okay, Fred, um, what about, well, I mean, you obviously have a different ecosystem <laughs> where you are, but what do you, what are your, some of thoughts of, about things that we could do to be more supportive of, of having, you know, these good kinds of conversation and influence at the board and ownership level. Well, um, I was thinking about the most, the multi-stakeholder co-ops here that where one of the membership categories is co-ops more than directly ownership to ownership and governance issues. I mean, that's the, <clears throat> Aside from lots of worker co-ops in, in the core economy, they're the biggest contribution I think Mondragon has make has made to uh, the cooperative movement is a really elaborate system of of multi-stakeholder co-ops where co-ops collaborate with each other, and they do that uh, in two ways, or there are two sort of outcomes, two focuses. One is um, creating institutions in common, and my ignorance of the of of the North American co-op movement, co-op movement outside of this area, such that there may be a lot more going on in this in this area that I'm aware of. But um, <clears throat> two ways that Mondragon does this: one is creating institutions in common that people who are familiar with Mondragon know about. Finance, both debt and venture capital, all co-ops get together. They make contributions. They do other kinds of things um, to ensure that co-ops have. Uh, as much financing available as possible, friendly financing, financing that understands uh, co-ops and their needs, and all kinds of other institutions in common, R&D and education and training and health, safety and well-being and others. So institutions in common where, where all the co-ops participate and, and all of the co-ops benefit, but then also um, pursuing co-op to co-op or promoting co-op to co-op collaboration to look for business opportunities things that your co-op has that mine doesn't and that mine has that yours doesn't. And if two, three, four, six co-ops get together and we force ourselves to meet once a month over, well, forever, then we will find, we will find business opportunities together because that's part of our mission. We know this will happen. It's hard. There are tires to pliers to put out every day. Um, there's the strategy and the operations of my own co-op. But if we force ourselves to meet with other co-ops in, in similar or even very different sectors, we will come up with ideas that will create new co-ops. And that has definitely been the case in Mondragon. I think that's the, <clears throat> that's, um, like I say, it's the most outstanding characteristic of Mondragon outside of the fact of lots of worker co-ops and, and multi-stakeholder co-ops. And just to clarify, Fred, sometimes co-ops are member, like in, in yours, there's students and workers and co-ops. So sometimes they're a class and then sometimes the whole co-op, like all the members are co-ops. That's correct. I mean, there's both of those. Uh, are they ever the full part. owners? Like this institution is only owned by co-ops or there's always a worker ownership element? Always. There's always a worker ownership Always a worker. Element. Okay. Always so it's never just a bank owned by co-ops. It'd be a bank owned by co-ops and people who work there and potentially. Have right. Bank. Well, I take it back. I mean, there are divisions and sectors in Mondragon that are second degree co-ops, multi-stakeholder co-ops. Well, maybe they're not multi-stakeholder. I'm not sure how to define it. Where, yeah. all, where the co-ops come together. To, and they actually have, some of the divisions have workers. So they're, I take it back. Workers always have a membership class. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes division sectoral co-ops are dominated by the co-ops in the division or sector and they're there to look for these kinds of opportunities together okay and when was you that, talk about co-ops being members who's the person that sits on the board does a co-op appoint a person to represent them or does the board 
a co-op so right so if there are five co-ops in a, in, a, in a sector um the board of each co-op appoints from it from inside x number of uh its members to be on the divisional or sectoral board okay so roughly should... in proportion to the co-op size interesting okay I just wanted to clarify that there's well you'll find this when you start reading there's all these like nuances of you know does everybody choose the people in each sector or do only the people in those their sector choose the their own representatives and there's there's kind of practice because there isn't a lot of there's no real law here except in state statutes so there's a lot of diversity in the practice um okay so elizabeth would you like to go for this ecosystem question what do you what do you think the co-op world could do to be more supportive of um having multiple voices at a table that are important to have so this is reminding me interestingly that uh the cooperative movement actually came out of the union movement and it was a group of unionized workers who were like wait a minute we're wait a minute why don't why don't we own it? <laughs> um, and and then here we are having this conversation today, all these years later. Um, and I, you know, it's making me realize too that the 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 union movement is for many of us is a path to worker ownership of our of our destiny and of of where we are. Um, and it's a very long and slow slog of a revolution, let me tell you. Um, and so, I'm sorry, I, I just got myself a little confused. Um, could you, could you repeat the question for me yeah, I'm sorry we were just thinking about what can what can the rest of the world do what can we in the co-op movement and the co-op ecosystem do to best support or refine or enhance or or you know support a good practice in this area yeah I think yeah I think that you know as I said earlier you know a free speech clause where people can actually speak up um, our free speech clause directly um states that we can speak up against decisions of management and the board without reprisal. And almost no workers have that. Um, and also just as far as, you know, workers go, just the right to card check, the right to sign up for the union of their choice and not have to go through the election process where, which is very lengthy and drawn out and businesses, including my own co-op, uh, hire lawyers to come in and do uh, these meetings with the workers and tell them about how bad unions are. I mean, it's like, you know, there's a lot of that stuff going on, um, even from co-ops and people are, and I'm not here to talk poo-poo about my employer, but the, the national president of my union said, wow, you know, it surprises me that the management, you know, when we're in negotiations is just as awful as, as when we sit down with General Electric and there are, you know, 17 lawyers on the, during negotiations. So I think there's a, an interest in keeping the co-op open and, and a financial viable organization. And the workers, the, you know, profit is theft. So the profit coming that's made off of the backs of our labor, we don't have a voice in what happens with that. And so how is it a co-op, I guess? Or what is really a co-op actually is, is the question that I'll end with. <laughs> Thank you. Provocative. So I have been looking at some of the questions. I'm sure you have, um, Ajua and George too. Um, so there are a couple, um, I'm going to ask a couple of those and then turn see what uh, what you guys also have been looking at in the chat. But that's a good actually this this patronage question is a good question and there are similar there are some not identical but aligned questions about compensation. So maybe um you could talk about for those of you for when workers are on the board, I mean are they are they compensated for their time for their board time? 
um, as workers or they're not compensated because other people aren't. So, so how does that work? And then in a related question, how does patronage work if you have different um, classes of owners in your co-op? Like is, you know, does everybody get the same or do workers get more patronage because they have more skin in the game and they have more to contribute or like, how does it work? So, um, so maybe Weaver Street again, you could just start uh, on that question of um, are workers paid for their board time? And then also how does patronage work at your co-op between the different classes of members? So I'll start and then I'll pass the second half off to one of my other teammates. Um, yes, so the entire board is compensated. So workers are compensated, the consumer owners are compensated, the appointed members are compensated for their time and leadership because it is recognized that we're doing a lot of work um, so yeah, that is, that's worked into essentially the board budget and I'll let John or James talk about how the dividends are dispersed. The, the dividend process is interesting because it's one of the few things that the board, uh, like directly owns, like in this, in a sense, that's not delegated to the general manager. Um, but that's kind of where it begins and ends. Basically, like every year, the board has to make a decision about how they divide it up. And we've uh, landed on a process that um, we've done for the last decade that's worked really where, well, where the, the, you know, the equity is split down the middle. And so the profit is split down the middle when there is one and then distributed based on dollar shopped. If you're a consumer or hours worked if you're an owner or if you're a worker and um there's fewer workers so for an per individual workers end up getting more of a payout and um, since there's so many consumers and then usually um um it's we turn we take that we, we uh we have the leeway to turn that into like um something that they can get at the cash register and put towards their, their um, purchase or whatever, instead of mailing out a check for $2 or whatever like that. Um, so it it's a pretty good process because it ends up being meaningful for workers in a, in a financial way when you're, you know, our wages are good, but they're still service industry wages. Um, and, and, uh, and then the board can decide on paying interest on, um, well, yeah, I don't know how into the weeds we need to get, but basically like it's, uh, for the workers, a portion of that is, or for both classes, a portion of the payout is kept a, kept in the co-op um, until you leave. And so the co-op is essentially borrowing from the workers. And um, so the board will pay interest on that um, as well if, they, if the board decides that there's money to do that. Um, so that's pretty neat. So we have some workers with internal accounts of, you know, $20,000 plus. Um, and so when they leave, they get, um, a little payout. And so, you know, in an ideal world, we could basically like self-fund workers' retirement. Um, you know, obviously we're not there yet, but, uh, you know, it's better than most places. Interesting. Um, Fred and at Mondragon, you don't do, you don't do patronage, you don't do profit sharing or patronage. Do you do anything like that or what happens to the business profits in a worker consumer co-op? Well, in, in, in the big worker consumer supermarket chain, um dividends only go to worker members uh consumer members um i mean the change claim is that consumer members benefit by by lower prices and other kinds of investments that the co-op makes in consumer education and uh health and safety consumer or, or food and product health and safety and that kind of thing <clears throat> In other co-ops where there are workers and different kinds of user members, um, generally mostly workers, but profit, but but uh, surplus distribution is pretty limited. Most of surplus is reinvested, especially when the users, <clears throat> but even workers, even workers, worker members tend to agree that most surplus should be reinvested or, or reinvested or put into collective reserves. It, there, there's a lot of a lot of them, so it depends depends to some degree on which one we're talking about. But uh, in most of them, workers get the lion's share of what surplus, what patronage dividends are paid, but not but patronage dividends are not that big in multi-stakeholder co-ops. Among them, 
Okay, interesting. Uh, Madeline at Blackstar, how do you, how do you, if you have a profitable year, how do you, um, I mean, do consumer members get a, get a, do they get the patronage or do you just make an allocation and bonuses to the workers or what, what do you do? And also are you paid, like if people, if workers were on the board, would they get paid their worker wage for that or not? Um, <clears throat> so first starting with the patronage, I have not been a black star when we've had a profitable year. So as far as I am aware, I believe it's equal. Um, everyone who is a member owner gets an equal patronage regardless if you work there or not. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, as for workers getting paid, our workers get paid if they attend board meetings. Um, and myself, I go to every single board meeting to present to the board. But if you are actually sitting on the board, you do not get paid. Okay, so for attending they do, and for being a board member they don't. That. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to say on that question? Oh, uh, just that at the co-op where I work, the profits, you know, go out and patronage refund. But we've also negotiated for a percentage of sales, provided that there's a margin above a profit margin above. I think it's one point. Two five percent, we get a percentage of what's over that as a profit sharing. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> this is something that you know. This is and this is what happens to workers. Um, we negotiated for that. It used to be the equivalent of about a dollar an hour worked per year. You know, so about two hundred and eighty dollars for a full time employee. Two thousand, sorry, two thousand and eighty dollars for a full time employee. But now management has taken that and uh, very carefully crafted a program of discounts for members that come off of sales, not out of the discount line on the budget. So now we basically don't get hardly anything in profit sharing. So that's the kind of thing that happens that's really unfortunate. And um, it's unfortunate and mm -hmm. it doesn't, doesn't feel too great. So, but that's, but at least we have a voice in it and trying to like, okay, let's come up with a new formula and, you know, until that runs out. So on it goes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. And another question that came up in the chat, um, which is a little wonky, but I like wonky. So, <laughs> cause there, there actually is some confusion always about this. So when, when you have workers and you have consumers on the board, do only workers get to vote for worker representatives or do all members get to vote for all things? And some multi-stakeholder co-ops I know of, they even have like certain kinds of topics where, you know, they make it like in dissolution or something, right? Like that has to be voted on by every single class of member before a co-op's dissolved and not just a majority of all of the members. So um, so that's a question in governance. So like does do... do do only workers get to vote um, for worker members or or everybody? And it, you know, are there any other kind of things like technicalities where you make a distinction um, between them? So, um, so I guess the uh, Weaver Street and Mondragon, who actually have that structure, maybe you could answer that question. Sure. So. At Weaver Street Market, worker owners get to vote for the worker owner reps and the consumer owners get to vote for the consumer owner reps. Okay. Same here. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Um, another question that came up is, and this I think if people are thinking from startup, you know, they're, how did you guys come up with, or do you remember, does anybody know what's the lore? <laughs> how did you come up with? how you divide, like we had two, you know, situ you'd have up to a third, but those are, you know, like a black star that could be up to a third workers, but those would be consumer member workers or um, you guys, we were so you're half and half. So how did, like, how did you decide percentages or, and Fred, you had an example where you're third, a third, a third. I mean, is that just trying to be equal? I mean, or what, what was, how did people come up with these percentages of things? Does anyone have anything to say about this? I believe that we took it from the bylaws of the local cooperative in Austin that's older than us, uh, which is Wheatsville Food Co-op. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I believe that it was in their bylaws and we just kept it the same. Okay. Co-op answer is, is to what another co-op does. Well, in okay. our case, it varies a lot from, from co-op to co-op. Uh, at Oski, the supermarket chain was a consumer co-op for its first couple of decades or so, maybe less. And so when um, there was a big move to include workers as members um, and the General Assembly eventually <clears throat> agreed, the General Assembly of all consumer members, they <clears throat> it was a pretty fierce debate and they ended up saying, all right, half and half, but not, uh, not majority worker members. And other co-ops, other multi-stakeholder co-ops has, has varied a lot. Some of them are, the staff is quite small, but the number of user members who are other co-ops in the group is very big. So workers get a disproportionately large number of, mem of, of board seats, but don't, but don't dominate. Okay. And we restate your half and half, is that right? And the Okay. I just um, wanted to yeah, um, please. add in our union, our national president is elected. Um, we have national convention every other year and all the officers, national officers of, of our union are elected at that meeting. So generally people don't run against an incumbent unless they're doing something wrong. Um, but there's no contract like there is with a, with a general manager of a co-op. In addition to that, it's in our, our founding um, words of our constitution that the national president doesn't make more than the highest paid worker. And I can tell you that at our, our food co-op, that is not the case in any kind of way. And not only that, but the, the members, the unions at the local level at each individual shop vote on the wages of the staff and the national president and the, all, the, all the offices. So the vote, it's very bottom up oriented uh, structure and it's transparent. I know what they all make. Um, and I don't know what the general manager where I work makes. I mean, I can guess, but I, I don't know. Interesting. Um, George and Ajwa, do you have other questions you've been looking at the chat you wanna bring up? Yes, I have one. Um, the question is, uh, besides Weaver Street, in what ways have you all intentionally included the voices of minoritized communities in co-op conversations and changes involving the co-op, members, workers, and shoppers? This includes, but is not limited to people from the global majority, LGBTQIA+, disabled, seniors, veterans, et cetera. Um, I can take on that question. Um, Black Star is a predominantly uh, white male cooperative, both in terms of workers as well as member owners. Um, but we really do take our concern for community uh, principle very seriously at Black Star. And so we often, um, about once a month, do a collaboration beer with different community organizations uh, local to Austin um, and proceeds from that beer go to that organization. Um, uh, organization, I think it's our most popular one that we do every year for Pride Month is Out Youth. Um, being from Texas, the LGBTQIA plus community is very much ostracized um, in large parts of Texas. So we do a lot of work with Out Youth and we do a collaboration beer. It's called Wish You Were Queer. It's absolutely delicious. It's a peach beer. Um, and proceeds from that beer benefit that organization. Um, and we also work with, um, Blackstar is actually very strange, not strange. Um, I, I love that it's like this, um, where our management is actually mostly people of color 
while our um, workers are not. So we have this really weird um, dynamic um, of whenever we are asked this question, we're like, well, the representatives of Black Star are, but we don't like, you know, our workers aren't and our member owners mostly aren't. Most of our board members aren't. Um, so we are trying to bridge that gap. We are trying to uh, go, especially in Austin, um, which is a largely gentrified town at this point, we are stationed at, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Austin, at uh, St. John's and Airport, which used to be a very low income neighborhood, which is now being gentrified um, pretty rapidly. So we try really hard to continue to connect with the original people from that area and making sure that our beer and food prices are always accessible to them and making sure that we are a resource for the houseless population that is mostly around that area. Um, we also work with CAP Metro, which is our public transportation in Austin to continue to um, increase the amount of public transportation, increase public transportation safety, and increase the use of public transportation. Because um, right now in Texas, they're trying to expand our main highway in Austin, and that would cut off a lot of housing for the un for people, low income housing. Um, so we are trying to really work with our tr public transportation to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, so those are just a couple of the ways that we do that. Um, Great, thank you. Um, anybody else wanna talk about, and I'm, not, I'm kind of interested too in just the question of like having a multi-stakeholder co-op, does it, does it, do you think it makes people kind of more cognizant of just other voices? Like, yeah, let's have, you know, even if those other voices aren't necessarily owners or at the board, or, you know, does it make you, kind of better listeners in some way. I wonder if, or maybe a lady could take that just because you're the board president. Do you feel like it makes a difference? So you've been on other boards. Do you feel like it makes a difference? Um, I would say no, not at all. Um, and I do serve on other boards. I'm currently on a few other boards. Um, being on Weaver Street Market, I'm one of very few non-white individuals um, that has served on Weaver Street in 35 years. It, that's actually one of my purposes of being on there and being the manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, what I find amongst boards in general and kind of in the co-op movement, I'm not sure who would agree. It's not really, you know, it's not to say, hey, let's argue about it. But overall, um, it's a monoculture within co-ops. And that also that spreads to the board as well. So there's a recognition that you have workers and there's a recognition that operations exist, but just because you have that class of people doesn't mean that you actually go and speak to those people or feel that those people have the room or the space or that you allow the room for those people to also speak um, and for their voices to be heard and to be heard in an equitable man a manner. So for me, um, it's very important. It's, you know, it's my job, but it's also my life. And it's, it's, a, it's something that I was passionate about. I know John and I worked together, especially as he was rolling off and I was rolling on to really not just say that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a part of operations, but now it's a part of the board because those mm -hmm. are held as two separate entities. So that, you know, when you are reviewing policy, you're actually looking at it through an equitable lens. You're looking at, you know, you're defining what diversity means on a board. It's not just having different colors of skin on the board, but it's actually having the diverse experience and for all of those people to be counted equally as it is stated in the bylaws. So across boards in general, no, I don't think that, you know, having different classes and different statements of who these people are really means that they are being included. I think that it's rewriting the policy, the underlying foundation, the culture of not just your board, but also the culture of your operations. So that when operations does report to the board, when they do attend meetings, that they're not overlooked, they're not restricted in their time or in their voice. So I think that it's more than just the statement of it. But I think that it is, it's the operational function of the board outside of the day-to-day -day mechanics of the company to also say diversity, equity, and inclusion is what we do. And if you are not abiding by that, then maybe you don't belong on this board very intense. Okay, hey, thank just you. To, yeah, go up, please. Just, yeah. Just to piggyback on on that, like um the uh the, the one thing that does work on our board is that we do have this framework of like Alana was talking about the policies and stuff, but we, we, we have workers on that board who are holding or setting that policy and, you know, who can, can create a framework to hold the co-op accountable 
in very real ways about how we measure you know goals related to diversity equity and inclusion and i think you know you know like in our co-op the that conversation was led by black workers and if we didn't have that representation on the board i think a lot of those black workers would have left and not had a fruitful experience and but now like um it's just really changed the whole conversation within the co-op um do you think that's true alana yes i do think i think that it, it is one of those things of you know the the worker owners are voting for who they would like to see on their board. So it's not just saying, you know, yes, we want more diversity. It's that person standing up and saying, yes, this is what I want, having that conversation, and then also having the support of your entire worker population. And when you get there, you know, at the end of the day, I do go back to operations. So there is that conversation as a worker owner representative of how is the treatment, what is actually going on on the board. So it's hard to, you know, to not share a board packet because that's my job. But then there is also, there's a lot to the representation of saying, wow, your board chair is a black bodied female and now she has a voice and now she is the board chair. So I definitely think the representation is extremely important. Thank you, I appreciate it. Anybody else wanna? Elizabeth, yeah. Um, I'm just gonna jump north of the border to a union that's up in Canada. And they have a very progressive, they, they're awesome, but they have an umbrella group that contains, um, it's called equity, the equity seeking groups. So it's women, LGBTQA, a, uh, people of color, disabled workers and young workers who are generally not on boards and leadership and whatnot, traditionally in unions. And representatives of those, those groups each get together individually across the whole country. And all five of those groups get together as a unit and, and do the work. And then educational platforms come out of that to the locals and up to the leadership and they, also have representatives of all those groups at their national conventions. So usually the delegates that are elected are, you know, the president of the local, a lot of, I mean, just a lot of white men. That's just how it is. Um, so they're actually putting folks in the place where the decisions are being made and, and the education is real because they're there on the floor while the constitution's being discussed and whatnot. And just this past year, they have their first woman national president of the whole union. Um, and our union, we work closely with them. Um, and we've started doing that in our union as well, where, you know, if there's an organizing blitz or there's a big contract that's coming up, you know, they'll send folks from that qualify for those equity seeking groups to sit in with the staff during negotiations and learn the skills. And actually workers have gotten hired by the union as union staff um, through that program. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. We are so on time. George and Ajwa, do you want to have any parting remarks? I'm going to do my, like, thank you guys so much. I just, every single one of you have contributed so much to this conversation. I really appreciate everybody's time and, and thoughtfulness here. George and Ajwa. Yes, this was a fabulous conversation and it went too fast. Uh, but we wanna encourage you to um, fill out the feedback form so that we can get your ideas. And you know, as you know, we'll probably have another forum that you know leads off of this. George? Yeah, the, an incredibly rich discussion. So thank you very much. And the questions are great. We've tried to address as many of those as we can and we will follow up with resources. And I know a lot of folks in the chat already indicated they wanna continue con uh, smaller conversations and so forth. So um, this was exactly what we hoped for and it's great to um, see that everybody's so enthusiastic about it. And thank you so much to Margaret and the rest of the panel for a wonderful uh, discussion and donations of time. We appreciate it. Anyone else, a quick closing? 
comment? Yeah, Marks, yeah that would be great. Thanks to everybody. I've been a firm advocate, especially in my role of cooperation amongst cooperatives, as it says in our principles, but not as often as people actually do. So thank you for pulling this group together. It's pretty fantastic. All right. Well, th thank you, Margaret. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everybody who attended and let the conversations continue. Great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Take care, everyone. Bye, all. Uh...